what I think um, I'm going to do is try and um, be a catalyst for the next two days. So I want to really open up a whole stream of conversations that will doubtless continue over coffee breaks, um, lunches, and, and so on, and into the evening, hopefully. That's how I see my role here. But to do it, I'm going to reflect really on um, how I see the field um, having developed over the last 25 years that I've been involved in it, from very much from my own perspective. So there's a lot of me in this talk for which I apologise. It's always a difficult balancing act. Do you try and do something that's really broad and risk being vacuous, or do you try and ground something? So the best I can do is ground this in, in my own experience and my own journey, but very much talking to bigger themes as I go along the way. So we are here to discuss the frontiers, but I think to do that effectively, we need to look at the past, the present, and the future. So where have we been? Where are we right now? And where might we be um, heading next? Um, so, so that's my aim, to, to really kickstart um, the conference. Um, so Anne just gave a fantastic um, introduction to the book I wrote with Paul Sparrow, which is now actually 10 years old, which is quite shocking. Um, not as shocking as the fact that 25 years ago we had a workshop not unlike this one in Boston, um, from which really, truly great things happened. I was lucky enough, I was right at the start of my academic career, I was in my early 20s, I don't think I even had started my PhD in those days, but I was lucky enough to, to meet Anne and a number of other colleagues, and um, I still remember the um, wonderful conversations we had at that event, and from that event came a number of things. Um, so, the book, um, w what we tried to do in the book was review everything that had pretty well happened from that workshop, primarily the workshop was the catalyst, right through to about 2001. This books always come out two years out of date, um, but we really tried to be as up to the minute as we could be. And our basic thesis was, um, if we take seriously the idea that as social scientists we have a duty to our wider publics, we're not just here to write papers for each other, but we're really here to make a difference, then how far has this movement really um, generated a sufficient knowledge base that we could now really seriously help organisations to adapt and continuously reinvent themselves and if we haven't got to that point yet what do we need to do next um, in terms of a research agenda and so we we broke down the field of um, cognition and strategy into the three key stages of analysis choice implementation and said so if we look at that as a, as a proposition how far have we got what do we need to do next and it's fair to say most of the work that we reviewed in the book was all about explicit mental representations. How do we operationalize notions like schema, mental models? What are some of the dominant decision biases? How, how far have we got in investigating these? But lurking in the background was this thorny issue of emotion and the fact that dual process theory was really beginning to garner support. And if we take seriously dual process theory, then a lot of what we do is automatic, it's not controlled, it's not about effortful processing, how do we really begin to get a handle on some of those implicit, intuitive, non-conscious or less effortful processes? And all we really had to say about that was, this is where it's going, but it's very difficult and we don't really have any answers. And what I want to do is show you how over the last 10 years, that perspective has really changed. There's a lot happened since we wrote the book. Um, so. As I just said, my, my real philosophy here is we, we try and um, we do maximum rigorous academic work that has maximum academic impact, but with no contradiction there, I think what my work is about is trying to also you know, ground things in real world problems and really address issues of, of the day. Um, so you're aware of that as, as we go through this material. I've probably got far too much material, by the way, I know I have, because I've tried to go through this a hundred times and I run out of time, so we'll see how far I get. But um, I wish when we'd written the book, we'd known about the, um, rather more than I do now, um, about dynamic capabilities. Um, and I think at the time we wrote the book, dynamic capabilities was really just coming on stream. It was largely an economic black box 
concept. Um, and since we wrote the book, David Teese has written this paper in SMJ in 2007, which really tries to do much what we did in the book. It breaks down this idea of um, analysis, choice, implementation into three core um, dynamic managerial capabilities, which he hinges all around cognition, which is the idea of sensing the business environment, having the mental model of the day that's fit for purpose. Do you really understand what's happening in the world and how the world is shifting? Um, so that's very similar to analysis as we've studied it in cognition. Um, seizing opportunities and mitigating threats. Very similar to choice in the sense that he says that's all about effortful processing. Rational choice comes when we engage effortfully and systematically in practices that, that mitigate those biases. And um, implementation is, is really all about continuously transforming the organisation in the light of what's been learned. He's an economist, so he speaks about people as being intangible assets and, and resources. Um, now, that's a useful framework still, um, despite what Mark Healy and myself said in SMJ last year. It's still a useful framework as, as a way of hanging this whole field together for present purposes, I'm going to suggest. So a lot of my work then has been really about the problem of um, strategic drift, as, as my colleague Jerry Johnson would call it. So this is a typical life cycle of most people, groups and organisations. The world begins to change over time and we don't really change with it. We try. You know, those of us who are 50 something or 60 something, we've got iPhones and Blackberries, and we don't really understand their full capabilities. Um, and um, we make micro adjustments as best we can, and organizations do that, and institutional fields do that. And gradually over time, you, you reach this point of, of near catastrophe, at which point you then go into radical updating as best you can with a series of experiments which um, eventually you, you face the consequences, either radical transformation or complete demise. Now, there's, there's lots of people have written about this problem from a cognition perspective. I guess the model I had in mind back in um, the 1980s was if we can get people to, to really use cognitive mapping techniques, we can, we can do workshops, that sort of stuff, we can really systematically enable people to understand the limitations of thinking. The world will become a better place, organisations will adapt. It's incredibly naive looking back, but that was the kind of model I had at the time. And it's not that far removed from um, the kind of model that, that other people had. So having done various pieces of work um, in the first sort of 10 years or so of my career, I began to think very seriously about how can we adapt some of the tools that we've, we've theorised about and written about in the journals to try and um, bring about good things in, in practice. So how can we help managers overcome things like framing bias? and escalation of commitment using some of our theories and tools in, in a very practical sense. So that takes you to the sort of second phase of my work from the mid-90s onwards. These things are all still continuing. And then um, something um, pretty awful happened in the middle of doing that. I was running a workshop with some managers and I hit head-on for the first time what you might call a corporate psychopath. Um, a really, really disturbed individual who ran his organisation by, um, by bullying people and he tried to use the same tactics having hired us in ostensibly because he really bought into some of my earlier work and said I think you could really help us avoid the pitfalls of inertia and drift that you've been talking about. Will you help us do that? I said sure. Uh, myself and a colleague got involved and um, we really got pulled up sharp. It was clear that there were multiple conflicting agendas going on. We were there for a reason other than um, to help the organisation move forward. It was all about using us as tools for his self-validation with his organisation. And then I became deeply interested in the role of emotion in cognition. Um, and then uh, I began to delve deeper into what's current in social cognitive neuroscience, social cognition, neuroeconomics, and realised we really need to think again um, about some of our foundational assumptions. So that's my talk in a nutshell. And where I think the frontiers are 
is, is really getting into some of the deeper difficult issues that we sidestep for the first half of my career around how do we really access and tap into in a reliable and valid way some of the, the less conscious more intangible cognitive processes and where does emotion fit in and how do emotion and cognition intertwine and what does that have to say for many of our dominant theories that still play out in the literature today so so in the beginning was this wonderful workshop um, that was held in boston and from that i, I think three three career highlights for me were um, other than meeting many of the, the key scholars in the field at the time, some of whom have, have since retired, some of whom are still here in the room. Rhonda was just finishing her PhD at Urbana-Champaign and was just about to launch the 1990 Mapping Strategic Thought Book. I was just starting out in my career. But three things that, that stood out were the, the Porak and Thomas special issue, um, managerial thinking in business environments. The JMS actually sponsored that workshop. Um, Anne's book, which some of the papers in the book were also presented at the same conference. Um, and then I think that was the initial foundation for a meeting that then took place two or three years later in um, Washington, D.C. And from that was the, was the birth of the, the MOC division, ultimately. First it became a, a special interest group. So what I would say is events like this are really, really important and great things can happen. So let's hope um, that um, we replicate that and extend it over the next few days. So here's the early foundations to my work, and this was really was all the rage in that workshop. So these are my heroes, Herbert Simon, Daniel Kahneman, Carl White. They don't need any introduction, but what you see immediately is these, this sort of unspoken difficult tension between the idea that we're limited capacity information processes, very much the computer model of the day um, that was born, you know, just after the Second World War, really, or during the Second World War, when we realised that behaviourism was never going to cut it as a contribution to the war effort. Cognitivism really became quite dominant, but it was a particular form of cognitivism. And then Carl came along with, um, I think, a different perspective that, that potentially rocks the foundations of that, the idea that we actually, we make sense of reality. It's an interpretive process, not so much a computational process. And there have been some attempts to reconcile those um, paradoxes and, and tensions, but I think that we still have a long way to go in um, building a theory that, that really deals with both of those realities. Actually. We are, um, you know, um, still very much wrestling with that as an issue. Um, in my own work, when I, when I look back, starting from those theoretical pillars of bounded rationality and um, interpretation and social construction, it is interesting to see these are really the, the big dominant theories that I've drawn on from, from time to time. This is really the work we reviewed in the competent organisation. And it's interesting that all of these theories are still um, as dominant now as they were when they were written. They've endured. And this is why I think um, we need to protect and preserve scholarship for its own sake. Notwithstanding what I said about the fact that we as a, an academic body have a public duty to do something that's way bigger than just publishing journal articles. In fact, if you look at all the originators of these theories, they have done exactly that. And nearly in every case, the big breakthroughs have come from books, not from, from journal articles. I just offer that as a, as a reflection. Attribution theory was born, um, you know, um, very much in the 1950s. It's still with us now. Carl's work's been dominant. Social identity theory is, is very much current now. But the debates in social identity theory are very different from what they were then. But high quality, high impact, abstract scholarship that endures in the long run has the biggest impact on um, society as well. And, and every one of those theories is still making its mark right, right now. Um, so the application of this early stuff in my own work, as well as other people like Rhonda and Anne and um, Joe Porak especially, his work was, was foundational in um, doing some of this stuff, was um, to show that actually if we take seriously this limited capacity idea, then we ask managers how many competitors 
really keep you awake at night. Typically they answer six or seven, which, which fits neatly with, with bounded rationality, you know, working memory limitations, seven plus or minus two, Miller 1956. And the, the social side of this, the idea that these mental models converge, and there have been various explanations for that, but it, what it all comes down to is managers from different industries, from different organisations in the same field or industry talk to each other, attend conferences, read the same literature, mull over the same problems. What happens over time is we get belief convergence, and um, with belief convergence comes inertia, ossification, death. Well documented cases like the American auto industry um, would, would attest to that anecdotally. But what we still never really did was to, um, to do enough studies with sufficient rigour that we accumulated a really compelling um, body of work that tells that story consistently. So what I'm now trying to do is open this up a bit more. So some of the things I think we, we handled particularly badly in the early days, we took concepts like schema, mental model, cognitive map, frame, um, I could go on and on. And we use them all interchangeably. And loosely we use the term mental model for all of these things. And they're not the same. And if you've been trained in psychology, they're far from the same. There is this basic, very broad idea that the human mind has to create internal representations of reality. That's where the similarity begins and ends. So cognitive maps actually come out of behaviorism. So if you put rats in a tea maze and the reward is at one side of the tea or the other, the rat suddenly starts to develop a memory and a sense of direction and purpose. And Tolman, purpose of rats in behaviour and men, writing very much in the 1930s, coined the term cognitive map to account for that. That's a long way removed from mental models of competition. Mental models were coined by Kenneth Craig, another book, The Nature of Explanation. See, it's always books where these things happen. Um, and he reflected on um, how when we solve problems and understand complex systems, we build some kind of representation which can take many different forms. Johnson, Laid, people like that, Oxford, Chater, my colleague at Warwick, they've taken that idea forward in a very abstract Boolean algebraic sense. Very different from cognitive maps. Anyway, Jim Walsh sort of wrote this piece in, in 95. Everybody knows it. And, um, and said, but that's kind of okay in management. He didn't really admonish us enough, I don't think. And I remember a few years later trying to get a paper published where I did exactly the same thing and he was the action editor and he said I know I kind of said this is okay but it's not really is it um, so I got some very blunt review of feedback but we have we still continued to fudge it you know schemas schemata mental models cognitive frames um, what's the other one scripts we, 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 we were way too loose in our, in our use of language. And I worry now that right now, as we move into this sort of intuitive, implicit attitude formation, attitude change stuff, we're about to replicate the same mistake. I get paper after paper to review where people assume tacit knowledge, intuition, implicit memory, it's all the same thing really, it's just non-conscious. Well, it's not all the same. If it was all the same, we wouldn't evolve these different concepts. So we've got some interesting conceptual and measurement challenges as we move more and more into this territory, away from the explicit. I think the other thing I've, I've already alluded to is that we glossed over some potentially fundamental tensions like computation versus sense-making. You see it lurking around in psychology as well in decision-making. We've got the nat naturalistic decision movement. Interestingly, Kahneman and Klein have recently um, the two champions, respectively, of um, you know, standard behavioural decision theory versus naturalistic decision making, have recently written a couple of pieces together where they say they've failed to disagree. But if you talk to um, Gary Klein, um, as I did a couple of years ago at a conference where I was doing a talk and he was the moderator, he's really still wrestling with many of these issues and really doesn't buy into the idea of rationality at all. Um, he's much more interpretive, I think, than, than um, he realises. So there's another sort of frontier issue that's still lurking around. Um, 
I think early work on team cognition, looking back, was incredibly simple. You know, the idea that you just take a matrix of judgments from lots of different people, work out the mean, and that's the group, that's the team cognition. That's where we were in the late 80s. Seems unthinkable now. But look where we are now. We've kind of gone almost to the other extreme. If you think about now the plethora of constructs we've evolved to try and capture dispersed cognition from heedful interrelating to team mental models. Now team mental models is broken down. You have to have a model of them. who's in the team, what their capabilities are, how far you trust them, what the nature of the task is. Then you start to look and stand back and see how um, emergency services, for example, respond to terrorist alerts. If a bomb goes off in the centre of Manchester, 27 agencies in the UK come together to deal with that. Now, are you seriously telling me that um, each of those agencies has to have all these different constructs at play and then they need to communicate with each other? It's just not plausible psychologically. Um, that that's how we have evolved. We've been great at evolving constructs to try and progress the science, but I think we've over-complexified and we're still doing it. And with that over-complexification will come a ton more of alternative measures, ways of, um, of studying these phenomena, which is great for getting papers published, but in the long run for knowledge accumulation, I'm not so sure. Um, especially then when we apply this to, to the idea of multi-team systems, which I think, by the way, is another frontier issue. So teams made up of teams, then that level of complexity becomes unmanageable. So here's another issue. How do we stream back some of these constructs to make space for new constructs that can deal with that layer of complexity? Um, we've also had a proliferation of techniques for revealing and comparing explicit mental representations at the expense of knowledge accumulation. I kind of hinted at this earlier, but if you take one tiny area, the work that myself, Rhonda, did our PhDs in, Kevin Daniels working with Jerry Johnson, Eric Walton in 86, I've just picked a handful of the many papers I could have put up there. Every one of those studies uses a different method in a different industry with a different kind of sample. Um, how do, so you've got all sorts of compounds that we're creating by chasing novelty. You know, every new student in this game feels the need to make their mark by creating a new measure, a new construct, a new approach. But the when you really stand back at 60,000 feet like we're doing now, what does that, you know, that would never happen, say, in psychology, in cognitive science. You'd have maybe 20 or 30 studies would interrogate one method. They'd stick with it and they would do all sorts of things to unravel. Then they move on to another method. So you're not systematic here. What we're being is we're, we're creating all sorts of confounds in chasing novelty. Um, I think again, are we about to replicate the same thing when we move into trying to, if you like, granulate all the stuff on implicit attitude measurement, um, implicit memory, um, intuition. There's a whole ton of new measures about to bombard the field of management if we're not careful in exactly the same uncoordinated way. So anyway, that, notwithstanding all those problems, um, with great gusto, somewhere in the mid-90s I thought, this is a fantastic time to now launch myself in the real world and see how we can, we can apply some of these concepts to real life problems. So I did that in very interesting and diverse ways, I think. Um, I had a, an ESRC grant in the mid-90s, um, so this wasn't AIM, this was pre-AIM. There was a thing called the Risk in Human Behaviour Programme. I'd just arrived at Leeds in 1995 and three of my colleagues, John Moore, Alan Pearman and Keith Glaister, took me to one side and said, your first task is to help us land an ESRC grant um, to, um, to do some work in, in this area of risk in human behaviour. Will you join us? Will you in fact, lead the, the project? So that, that, that's kind of, I was lucky enough to, to get one of those grants. And what we did was to say, well, if we take something like framing bias, well documented in the lab, how do we make that um, in, um, as real world applications as we can, but still with the rigour of laboratory experimentation. Um, how is it possible to, to test the efficacy of dominant techniques like causal mapping as an intervention? So there are people like Colin Eden who, at, at Strathclyde who've been running around for years 
doing lots of interventions in organisations with Decision Explorer. So if you think of the medical analogy, here is a, a, a practice that's going on in the real world. Now, going back into the lab, how can we develop an evidence base? So this is before evidence-based management came on the scene, really, but that was kind of my thinking. Can we develop systematic evidence that would show the efficacy of some of these techniques? Again, notice it's all about cold cognition, overcoming bounded rationality limitations. And that theme still ran right through my work, still does in many ways. And what we were able to show um, through various studies was that that is possible. If you um, get people to read fairly complicated and sophisticated decision scenarios, run into several pages, so getting on for 800 words, real detail and intrigue and intricacy, not, not a one paragraph thing where you know a few hundred people are going to die or a few thousand people are going to die depending on the odds but this really was you know you've been in the market for years you now have to either stick in the market and rejuvenate yourself or go really riskily overseas but the payoff could be fantastic but you don't really understand the industry norms overseas that kind of intrigue now what are you going to do and we got these um, cognitive maps so you read all the stuff, you do your cognitive map, you make your decision. No framing bias. You read all this stuff, you make your decision, framing bias. Then you do your cognitive map, elaborate justification for the biased decision that you've just made. That was our kind of thinking and that's where a lot of our work went. And then around that time somewhere lurking in the background was a guy called Robert Coles. Now Robert worked for KPMG as a senior consultant and his specialist area is information technology risk and um, information security. So he did a PhD part time with me and we applied much the same kind of logics that have been applied in mental models of competition to information security risk um, around the run up to Y2K. If you remember, year 2000, planes were going to fall from the sky on the 1st of January, patients were going to die on the operating table, we were going to have a catastrophic meltdown. Now Robert's day job was to go around with package solutions scaring the hell out of people, saying this is what's going to happen to your organisation, but hey, KPMG can help you out. Um, now, if you stand back, um, there are many similarities to um, the kind of theories that um, we've talked about in, in the competition area. So what's happening there is people like Robert are a source of um, um, normative isomorphism. His job is to spread like a disease um, solutions to these problems. And part of that was his thinking in doing a PhD was, I need tools and techniques I can use to workshop some of these issues. By the way, I hate using um, nouns like I just have as adjectives, so please forgive me for that, I strike that off. But, but the idea that you could design workshops and facilitate change using some of these same tools that we'd used on mental models of competition to understand problems like Y2K. So here's an example of um, some of the work from his PhD. The reason we're publishing it now, 10 years on, is that these issues were so sensitive at the time we collected the data, we had to agree to a sort of 10-year embargo, or we weren't going to be allowed anywhere. And you just had to mention the word Y2K and people were running for cover. Such was the hysteria. So what we've done is we've done these multi-dimensional scaling representations in the run-up to Y2K, after Y2K, and again, what you find is belief convergence, no cognitive change. Um, with controls for things like memory effects, so we follow part of the sample over time, but we also um, examine the effects of sample attrition from time one to time two, and we recruit new people at time two, several hundred of them, to demonstrate that their mental models are consistent with the people who we've followed through. And what we find is, is typically things like this, just to give you some quick insight. So we've got various computer scenario meltdowns going on. And in this particular two-dimensional map, we've got like a sort of frequency likelihood of occurrence and major impact, minor impact. Sorry, these, these should be really the other way around. But what you can see here is a nice white space. And that nice white space occupied with nothing is basically very likely to happen, major meltdown for this organisation if it does. Nobody can envisage a scenario here. 
And when you look at some of the scenarios we were investigating 15 years ago, 10 years ago, there are things like um, disclosure of personal data, um, hackers um, stealing information, disks being stolen. Now, that was inconceivable at that time, but in the intervening years what's happened, just as we were publishing one of our articles in risk analysis, um, hot off the press came the news that HM Revenue and Customs in the UK had um, disclosed the personal details of 25 million householders publicly on a website. So, um, you know, this stuff um, is, is enduring. Um, so that then took me into an interesting um, scenario planning. And then I was lucky enough to get an AIM fellow. Um, Anne was the founding director of AIM. What I tried to do with, with the AIM Fellowship was to again stand back and say, here is a multi-billion pound industry that claims to be all about mental model change, getting people to anticipate the future and build adaptive organisations, very much framed in the language of cognition. So the first thing we did was to review all the literature on um, cognition and scenarios in the APA, A journals and related fundamental um, cognition journals and um, we then went through the popular literature and the claims that are being made in those sorts of books and what you see is um, the claims are scenario planning reduces bias to the status quo, increases sensitivity to multiple contingencies, if we use pre-written scenarios that frighten the hell out of people we can shock them into action and if we shock people with fear and insecurity we jolt them into required change. If you go through the psych literature, you can reinforce existing biases, you can create new ones towards a particular single future. If you don't have mental simulation, you don't get the cognitive benefits. And actually, um, jolting people with fear can stimulate negative affectivity, which um, multiplies out of um, all proportion, threat rigidity, the kind of thing that Storr, Sunderland and Dutton have been writing about in the early 80s. We also thought, well, um, what could we do at the social level? Many of these events are collective, like all strategic decisions or many strategic decisions. So if we think about the lens of social identity theory for a minute, it shouldn't be surprising that our attempted intervention failed, because what we really triggered were lots of emotional um, angst in the chief executive. And um, the reason for that is obvious. Social identity theory has told us since the late 70s, this desire for a positive self-concept leads decision makers to evaluate information more favourably if it affirms the self. But of course, this happens also in a group context. So if it contributes to our collective sense of, of well-being, it's even more likely to be evaluated favourably. So we then started to look at the literature that's already around very secure literature in social identity theory about how do you um, challenge and transform identity conceptions in a way that probably doesn't threaten the hell out of people. Well, there, there are different strategies that you could think about. So one of those would be to um, try and use people wherever possible who've got high intrapersonal functional diversity, that's a horrible mouthful. It means people who've been around the park a long time and have seen lots of different contexts and situations and, and functions. Um, so they don't become myopic. And then you can also think about some of the, the dominant literature on building superordinate identities. So that was our kind of recipe um, at the end of AIM. We, we can take the existing literature and we can use a sort of design science approach. But actually, when you stand back and, and think about it, it's still all locked in the, the cold cognition era of, of yesteryear. And when you look at what's happened recently in cognitive social neuroscience and neuroeconomics, it doesn't come anywhere. That kind of theorizing, those kind of concepts, don't come anywhere near. If we're trying to build descriptive models of reality as well as the prescriptive, it doesn't come anywhere near where it's at. So that's the journey I'm on now. And I think um, the most powerful um, quotation I've seen is this one from um, George Lowenstein, actually at Carnegie Mellon, interestingly enough. The decision paradigm as it has evolved is a product of a marriage between cognitive psychology and economics. 
From economics, decision theory inherited or was socialised into the language of preferences and beliefs and the religion of utility maximisation that provides a unitary perspective for understanding all behaviour. From cognitive psychology, decision theory inherited its descriptive focus concerned with process and many specific theoretical insights. Decision <coughs> theory is thus the brilliant child of equally brilliant parents. With all its cleverness, however, decision theory is somewhat crippled emotionally and thus detached from the emotional and visceral richness of life. Now, when you go back to our early work, I think most of it, we're guilty as charged. So what we did last year in SMJ was to revisit TC's framework, very much from this kind of new perspective, and say, how does this then, in general, mean we need to re-theorise um, MOC? And what we say is um, we need a series of, of counter-prescriptions while not destroying the, the broader sentiments of that kind of framework of the idea that organisations are, are going to wrestle for change. Now I'm going to really, really fast go through um, this stuff. Um, so how the world has changed is like this. When I was an undergraduate in the, um, the late 70s, early 80s, Gazaniger and Sperry um, had just got the Nobel Prize in medicine for their contribution to um, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience to be exact. And what they had done, um, Gazaniger was the neurologist, Sperry was the surgeon, and there was a condition, temporal lobe epilepsy, focal temporal lobe epilepsy. We're talking at the level where people have 30, 40 grand mal seizures a day. At that rate, you will die for sure. Um, so they pioneered a technique of neural ablation where you basically destroy the white band of tissue here, the corpus callosum, and you, to all intents and purposes you've completely disconnected the two cortices, the two cerebral hemispheres left and right. Now, on the back of that, um, Gazzaniga did some careful studies where he showed that we have um, hemispheric specialization for certain tasks, it's still the case. So for motor control, we have specialization for certain um, language comprehension tasks, we have specialization, motivational issues. There's a, there's a whole ton of stuff where we do have lateralization of function. The one thing they never ever said is intuitive people are right brain thinkers, left brain thinkers are, um, you know, logical and rational. And yet, very quickly as a field, we, management people, rushed in where angels fear to tread and just said, you know, Henry Mintzberg, bless him, 1976, managing on the left, planning on the right, or vice versa, I always get it mixed up, but he really did embrace um, this early neuroscience and run, um, and run with it. And then in no time we see papers appearing in AMR that suddenly we've gone from a biological exploration to a cultural explanation with absolutely nothing in between, by the way, that says, you know, it's all about the yin and the yang. Um, in an Eastern cultures are, are kind of dominated by the right brain and Western cultures are, are dominated by the left brain. That's not where it's at. Interestingly, David Teese's framework is all predicated around left brain, right brain thinking. Um, books are still coming out right now, citing me as an advocate of left brain, right brain thinking, I'm talking about management books. It's like, this is a myth that will simply not die. Um, and it's not current in psychology and it won't go away. Um, but it needs to go away because this is how the sort of, um, this is how we now think more complex. I'm not gonna do a 101 neuroscience. This is just to show you that using fMRI technology, What's clearly going on when people make decisions is um, they're far from rational because um, you've got a whole ton of stuff going on in the limbic system, um, the amygdala on both sides of the brain are active, they're in a conversation with the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, so this is the seat of emotion having a conversation with cognition. And there's a ton of stuff that supports this. So this, this continuous dynamic interplay between the limbic, the insular cortices, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, in a dialogue with the amygdala, the basal ganglia, other structures, deep lizard brain structures, apparently, um, as we characterize them in the past. And in social psych, um, they're kind of now getting down to a level where 
you can show these systems that are multiple and in concert with each other, but in different ways for different kinds of social cognitive tasks. So broadly, there are two systems, the X and the C, the reflexive and the reflective, the controlled and the automatic. But whereas our early dual process theory stuff was all about um, the role of the cortex is to keep in check biases and automated, um, taken for granted assumptions, the modern thinking is actually um, the cortex and the limbic system are in this dynamic and we're processing emotional information even when we're not consciously aware that that's what's, but what's happening and a lot of our conscious effortful thinking is infused with emotion and affectivity so we think we're being hyper rational when in reality we're, we're actually being rational in a way that rationalizes away some quite uncomfortable signals. That's changing the foundation of economics, at least for people who are believers. And it's also changing and transforming social cognition and cognitive science. So I think um, Matthew Lieberman is one of the people leading the way in psych, and I think Lowenstein is leading the way in economics, in a very parallel development. So, so to just give you an example here, these different combinations of, of similar structures but behaving very differently separate out here 21 different processes. That's Lieberman reflecting at a high level in the way I'm trying to do now in this audience for his own community. They're very sophisticated. So let me tell you, I'll put my cards on the table, I don't think we should be rushing down the neuroscience bandwagon and putting managers into brain scanners. I think we can never play catch up on this kind of scale. Uh, but I do think we need to be current with this stuff so that we can make our contribution to MOC distinct. So in economics, you get the similar idea that you've got the emotional and the deliberative uh, in a sort of tug of war. And if you look at what the typical consumer does in a brain scanner faced with a limited household budget, you have a choice of buying Jimmy Choo shoes or groceries for the kids. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, it's not as extreme as that, but um, you, I think you know where it goes. I've got a fantastic collection of guitars at home, um, <laughs> you know, that I probably could ill afford. Um, so, um, here's how things have changed. Early thinking dual process theory, which we drew on in our own work in this field, was like um, the normal state of affairs is automatic response when something shocking happens, the reflective system mediates that for action. So the job of the reflective system is to mediate the, um, the potential biases of the automatic process. Where we've moved to now is much more um, what's termed the, the parallel competitive view. So this is particularly social cognition. This is experimental cognitive psychology, the big shift. Jonathan Evans got an ESRC fellowship and this was the sort of the product of that. He wrote an annual review of Psych article in 2008 and, and a big book that, that kind of reviewed all this stuff. So the idea is that reflexive and reflective are in a continuous parallel interacting um, world and emotional signals are being processed. Um, Non-conscious emotional signals are being processed and are affecting our conscious thinking. So what does this say about cognitive mapping, for example? What should we be mapping? How should we be mapping it? There's a ton of other stuff that I haven't got time to go through. Risk as feelings, um, the idea of the affect heuristic, that if you give people um, a risk to assess and you measure their mood state, if their mood state moves from negative to positive, their evaluation of risk moves from highly risky to low risk. Um, the stuff about how um, from brain damage patients with damage to the VMPC, um, people lose the ability to anticipate um, the rules of the game in a competitive market situation and they um, lose um, key um, signals that come viscerally um, in decision making. So I think the, the conclusion I've reached is that true rationality really is the product of the analytical and the experiential mind and yet we've continued to focus on the, the analytical for much of our work. Strategizing is more than an exercise in thinking, 
It's a cognitive and an effective process, and our theories, research methods, empirical research, and scholarly interventions need to reflect this reality if we really are in the business of creating descriptive models and explanatory models that resonate with the true complexity of humanity, then we need to move on from um, this computational obsession that we've had. Cold cognition approaches to exploring mental model change and debiasing have had the day. They're not going to work in um, anything like um, the scale that's required for the scale of problems we're currently addressing. It's high time that we opened up the field to wider um, discussion and analysis. Now, I could go through a ton of stuff about how um, sensing, seizing and transforming have effective and non-conscious foundations. I haven't got time to do that, but you can read about it at leisure in the recent SMJ article. I'm more interested in what this says more broadly for our field going forward than just the analysis of dynamic capabilities. But we do know, for instance, that affect directs attention, possibly even controls it to opportunities and threats. How you feel determines whether you see something as a threat or an opportunity, not what you think. Um, Utilising affect as information has to be the way to go. If you just think about that, when, when people um, receive um, unwelcome information, there are two responses. You can either see dissonance that that creates as a motivation for change, or you can, what George Lowenstein would call the ostrich effect. People just stick their head in the sand and say, I don't talk to the hand. The face don't want to hear it. Um, so the implications then are that capabilities in diagnosis really um, are about embracing these signals rather than suppressing them. And we need systems, structures and tools that will enable us to learn from that dissonance and we don't have them at the moment. And this requires a safe psychological um, climate. The stuff on um, non-conscious foundations as well from intuition, Mike Pratt's work has been particularly influential in this area. The idea that we cut through detail, the analytical mind as Mintzberg showed really is bad at synthesis. So reflexive processes enable decision makers to see the big picture but we don't know enough about those. Um, so the implications then are sensing capabilities are not rooted in elaborate knowledge management systems. They can be the kiss of death actually. If you've been in these organisations where any question you pose the answer is it's in the database. Um, and we need architectures and technologies to support reflexivity as well as reflectivity. Um, and theories of organisation that would, would enable that to be done in a robust way. Um, the one sort of area where we dabbled, myself and another AIM fellow, Ian Clark, was to say, well, if we were to um, think about how you might design decision-making units within the strategy function of an organisation, you're really looking for this blend of the analytic and the... Um, the detail conscious analytic and the big picture and how do you get the two together. One complicating factor in all of this is that there are chronic preferences for analytic or intuitive decision styles. Despite the fact we're all dual process, potentially there are people who just don't trust their, um, their gut when they really should. There are other people who trust the gut when they really shouldn't. And there are people who are over analytic when that's the wrong task for the moment. And there are people who are not analytic enough when it's time for analysis. Um, so we started to say, well, is it about building teams where you get this versatility? Or is it about trying to train people to be versatile? And again, the, the jury is out on that. And there are complex issues around that. Um, like um, when you get people with chronic preferences at either extreme to work together as a team, they don't make easy bedfellows. You can get task and interpersonal conflict quite straightforwardly. Um, I'm going to even faster go over um, seizing and transforming. So when it comes to decision choices, much of us, T's included, but all of us, me included, I think I've demonstrated that now. I've really focused on this Kahneman-Tversky bounded rationality. I think where it's at now, though, is from neuroeconomics, we learn that immediate emotions shape many economic choices. From social cognition, we learn self-regulation and um, is a really key process that we need to understand more about. How is it that certain people are able to regulate their own emotion and the emotion of others um, to 
bring about efficacious decision choices where the majority of us who are mere mortals I don't think do um, and I mean there's a ton of work now starting to explode if we just take one decision bias escalation or one phenomenon I should say escalation of commitment we now know that you know the, the early work of Barry Storr and Co was great in showing escalation as a reality but the idea that thinking harder will get rid of escalation of commitment is simply not tenable there's work now showing that alleviation really is about um, protecting the ego while challenging the fact that the project's failing so how do you challenge the failed project without um, attacking the ego of the person who ultimately feels or is res responsible for the failing project we need to think new processes. Um, we know there's the, the work on hubris. Too much hubris creates bias, but too little self-regard can create persistence. Disengagement requires self-regulatory processing. So we have to skillfully, um, by definition, incorporate emotion into the reasoning process. Our tools are not yet fit for purpose. Um, when, when we think about emotions in strategic decision making, I've done that. So lastly, um, transforming. Um, now, Thies is sort of um, at, the, at the, his own frontiers at this point, And he actually says it's about managing identity and rewards and incentives. But that's kind of difficult and murky, and we haven't really got much to say. Um, so we decided we would say it on his behalf. So we said, OK, so if we go into the identity literature, what are the current models of identity in organisations telling us? And when you look carefully, people like Alex Haslam, who's a good friend of mine, um, you know, and other people, um, they're really advocating, again, cold cognition kind of set the superordinate identity at such a level that everybody will buy into something. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to say it rolls off the tongue effortlessly, but the reality is it underestimates the difficulty of emotional backlash, the real emotional backlash that comes when people feel that their core identity is under threat. Think about those of you who've been through organisational change in your own universities, what happens when one department merges with another? We don't just say, oh yeah, um, I can see why we need to do this. We get all steamed up under the clams and all sorts of interesting behaviour follows. So again, if you go to what's current in the neuroscience literature, interestingly again, it's all around self-regulation and it's about what happens when the dopaminergic centres of the brain, the bits that really get off on reward and pleasure, come under attack. And the kind of reactions that you see are a bit like when someone suffers an amputation at the scene of an accident literally the same brain centers that process acute pain and distress kick in big time when you put people under identity threat that's what the neuroimaging stuff is suggesting so again you've got to say to yourself what does this say then about the kind of models we're putting out um, that theorize change and um, they don't come anywhere near so this recategorizing superordinate identities, building fluid identities, it's really about how do we now theorize um, the role of affective and reflexive mechanisms in affirming the self, affirming um, consonant identities, while at the same time enabling identities to evolve. So some conclusions. So what I'm really questioning is the behavioral plausibility of much of the work we've done in the earlier foundation years. Um, I've taken a social neuroscience view of um, human functioning without trying to turn MOC into neuroscience. I don't think that's the way to go. Dynamic capabilities clearly entail reason and emotion in tandem. So we need to theorize new skills, processes, disciplines, <coughs> routines in the organization. We need to um, build or enable others, I think, to build um, appropriate support systems that celebrate rather than militate against hot cognitive processes. So some key challenges, and this really is the wrap-up. I think um, I wrote this annual review of psychology article with Mark Healy in 2008 where we, we kind of touched on this stuff is really building on where we left off. I think we've moved um, a bit forward from that and we're more focused on strategic management now. But what I tried to do in the annual review piece was, was talk to um, 
IO psychologists in general about what have we achieved in, in cognition research across, across the board there and we kind of hinted at some of these processes but I think we do face a choice now. If we're trying to elevate understanding of the dynamic interplay between cognition and emotion in organisations then the choice we face is we can try and build on existing models and frameworks just by adding in new control variables, new contingent variables or we can develop entirely new bodies of theory and research. That's, that's another sort of frontier issue that we, that, that we should face. We do need to develop new methods of assessment for tapping into these less deliberative and hot cognitive processes and outcomes. I think cognitive mapping, as currently practiced, needs some heavy revision. I think the implicit stuff is only just coming on stream, but we need to avoid some of the pitfalls of the past in having too many measures. And how do we develop measures for that that are going to be acceptable to our kind of participants? Um, senior executives in many cases. Um, to what extent and in what way we can do that, um, who knows. Um, um, I think this is the last slide. How to strike the balance between naturalistic and controlled methods. Not just lab versus field, that always depends on what your research question is. So I'm not trying to simplistically advocate one or the other. We need, of course, we need lots of different methods. But there, there may be potential here for some simulation techniques that we've rarely exploited in this community. So intelligent, you know, systems approaches, agent-based modelling um, would be one. Dynamic systems might be another. I think we could potentially exploit more than we have. But how to incorporate these latest insights from social neuroscience without turning ourselves into, into neuroscience? Because I don't think we are. I don't think we ever can be. I think we'll do third-rate neuroscience. The papers I'm seeing coming out are really at the level of saying, well, when managers are emotional, it's all happening in the limbic system. When they're being rational, it's all happening in the cortex. Big deal. We knew that um, 20 years ago. So it's how to leverage the insights from individual level, level advances reviewed in this talk to enhance. So let's think now, what does this mean for team cognition, organisational cognition, and bigger organisational fields? Now, Timo, who's sitting over there um, with uh, Mark Healy and myself very much as the, the back partner, we, we, we've begun to think about... Um, what this might mean for team mental models, having implicit as well as explicit mental models in a team environment. So if a lot of what's going on is actually going on at a beyond conscious awareness level, we could have consensus around the table now on an issue, while at the same time being far from an agreement, subconsciously. So what does that then um, mean for the field in terms of opening up you know, new theory, new processes, um, new ways of, of managing. So, um, we're there really. Um, I would say what I'm trying to do is move us from, from this is the conclusion of David Teese after a lifetime's work, you know, managers um, and enterprises may be more like biological organisms and some of their colleagues are willing are willing to admit but that in the end is the overriding image despite saying that that's the image he leaves us with so that's it i'm done